Some glad morning when this life is over, I'll fly away to a home on God's celestial shore. morning. When I die, hallelujah, bye and bye, hey. I'll fly away. Just a few more weary days and then I'll fly away. To a land where trust will never end. Hey. I'll fly away in the morning. Now. I'll fly away. Oh, glory, I'll fly away in the morning. Take your Bible this evening. I'm not sure you're able to see it, but do the best you can. Acts 26, Acts chapter 26, please, for our scripture reading tonight. Acts 26. I think I'll just read the scripture to you this evening, okay? I won't ask you to try to see it. Some of you may have a hard time with that. But I'll read the scripture this evening, Acts 26, and I'm going to read the first five verses of Acts 26. And let's stand together as we read the scripture. The Bible says, Then Agrippa said unto Paul, Thou art permitted to speak for thyself. Then Paul stretched forth the hand and answered for himself, I think myself happy, King Agrippa, because I shall answer for myself this day before thee touching all things whereof I am accused of the Jews, especially because I know thee to be an expert in all customs and questions which are among the Jews, wherefore I beseech thee to hear me patiently. My manner of life from my youth, which was at the first among mine own nation at Jerusalem, know all the Jews." which knew me from the beginning, if they would testify, that after the most straightest sect of our religion, I lived a Pharisee. Let's pray. Father, I pray you'll add your blessing to the reading of our scripture tonight. And thank you, Lord, for the uh, wonderful music this evening, Lord. We enjoy singing together the songs of God. We enjoy being able to laugh together at church. Lord, this is our church family, and this is our uh, weekly reunion that we get to have, and uh, we sure do enjoy being with the people of God in this place. And so, Lord, I'm praying now that you will prepare our hearts and make us ready to receive the truth from your word this evening. Lord, while we enjoy the music and we enjoy singing and laughing with one another and fellowshipping, Lord, we, we, would, be, we would fall far short of what you want to accomplish in our lives if we didn't listen carefully to the preaching from your word. Lord, I know that it pleases you through the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. And so I pray that you would make our hearts ready to hear your word this evening. Bless the special now to that end. In Jesus' name, amen. Amazing grace, how sweet that sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost. But now I am found, 
I was blind, but now I see. T'was grace that brought my heart to fear, and grace my fears relieved. How precious did that grace appear, the hour I first believed through many dangers, toils, and snares. I have already come. Tis grace hath brought me safe thus far, and grace will And we've been there ten thousand years, bright shining as the sun. We've no less days to see. Praise then when we first be gone. Amen. It's good. Now, Father, we bow before you in prayer as we open up your word tonight. Thank you, Lord, as We have already sung about. Thank you for preserving your words for us. We believe that all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. That not only have you inspired these words, but you have preserved them for us. And we believe we hold them in our hands tonight. We don't believe they're the words of men or the words of a man, but we believe them to be in truth the very words of God. And so, Lord, I pray that each of us would listen carefully tonight to what your Spirit would say to us. As on this old-fashioned Sunday, we give out a clear call for the old-time religion. Unpopular as it may be in our day, Lord, I pray that there'd be churches like this one all across our country that would call men and women back to the old-time religion. So help us this evening and minister to our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. Heard a story about a pastor who called two boys into his office. One boy was asked to wait outside the door while the other was escorted into the pastor's office. He had him sit down in a chair and the pastor sat across from him and said, Son, I have a question for you and I want you to Think hard before you give me your answer. Okay, the boy said. The pastor looked him in the eye and he said, Now tell me, where is God? The boy gulped and thought for a minute. And again, the pastor looked at him and said, Where is God? And again, the boy hesitated. He really did want to give the right answer, but he wasn't sure what he's supposed to say. And the third time, and he raising his voice a bit, the pastor looked at him again in the eye and said, Where is God? The boy got nervous and frustrated. He jumped up out of the chair and ran out of the office. And when he ran out of the office, he got in the hallway and grabbed his friend by the arm and said, Come on, we got to get out of here. They can't find God and they think we know where He is. (laughs) 
Well, I, I would say there's many places, sadly, there's many places of worship in our country and throughout the world today that have lost God and they don't know where to find Him. They're religious, but they're not spiritual. Paul here, standing before Agrippa, gives his testimony. And he lets us know in verse number 5, he's saying that the people from my own nation of Jerusalem know if they knew me from the beginning and they testify that after the strictest sect of our religion, I lived a Pharisee. Now most of us know that though he was a very strict Pharisee, he was not a Christian. Paul would be a wonderful example of someone who is religious but lost. Religious and practicing the most strictest sect that they have known at that time, which was the sect of the Pharisees, and yet he knew nothing of Jesus Christ as his Savior. His testimony says he was religious, but he was anti-Christian. He was anti-Christ, committing to prison and even murdering those who would follow the Lord Jesus. I would think religion has been a bigger tool and probably used by Satan to send more people to hell than any other thing. Man is, I guess you could say, a religious creature. By that, God puts in man the knowledge that there's something greater than him. Men everywhere worship something. Men everywhere worship something or somebody. The Hebrew will have the Talmud, the Chinese will have Confucius or Mao Zedong, the Japanese has his Shinto shrine or Buddha god shelf, the Mohammedan has his Quran, the Muslim will bow towards Mecca, the Hindu has his Shasta or will worship cows or rivers or creatures. You have the cults in our country which are really all over the world, Mormons and Jehovah's Witnesses, and sadly many times Jehovah's Witnesses have reached the mission field before the gospel has reached the mission field. And then you have all kinds of different religions and denominations in America. You have Jews and Catholics and Greek Orthodox and Lutheran and Episcopalian and Presbyterian and Church of God and Church of Christ and Church of God in Christ and Nazarene and Unity and Apostolic and Reformed and Anglican. And now you have the Gay Church and the Church of Satan. You have non-denominational churches, and lest you think the Baptists are all right, there's so many different kinds of Baptists. There's American Baptists, German Baptists, Swedish Baptists, Southern Baptists, Conservative Baptists, General Baptists, General Association of Regular Baptists, Old Regular Baptists, Hard Shell Baptists. There might be Soft Shell and Half Shell, I don't know, but there's <laughs> Primitive Baptists, Missionary Baptists, and Independent Baptists. There's a lot of religion in the world. A lot of religions in the world. You say, well, which one is right? I'd say none of them are right. It's not religion. See, religion has come to mean mostly outward actions only. Ezekiel said that with their mouth they show love, but their heart goes after covetousness. They hear, God says, they hear my words, but they do not do them. Titus 1.16, they profess they know God, but in works they deny Him. Like one daughter of a former president saying that she believed that outlawing abortion would be a sin, would be unchristian. What? Outlawing the murder of babies would be unchristian? There's somebody who professes to know God, but they have no idea what God believes. The world seems to want a popular religion that will accept them as they are, permanently and without a challenge. A religion that goes along with what they already believe. A religion that will not object to how they're living now. A religion that will let all men go to heaven and still believe whatever they want to believe. That's what... Man is looking for it. By the way, we have more religion now than ever before and have had zero impact on our world. 
give me the old time religion. And by that, I'm going to share what that is. Now, I know that's not popular. The kind of church that we have here, and there's churches like this uh, across the country, but you know, this is not the popular church. This is not the, 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 the hip church. It's not the one that everybody, you know, that, that the way they say you ought to market the church. Understand that. But I'm not in it to be popular. We're in it to be right with God. The unpopular religion is the old time religion. I believe the old time religion, why it's unpopular is because, number one, it insists on some things. Number one, it insists on repentance. You know, Jesus said, except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. Repentance. Repent means to change your mind. Repent means to do an about face. That, that you, you change your mind about what you were doing and you're going to do differently. A man was praying at the altar with his pastor. He prayed a prayer that the pastor had heard him pray many times. Lord, take the cobwebs out of my life. Lord, take the cobwebs out of my life. And as you're getting ready to say it the third time, the pastor interrupted him and said, Lord, just kill the spider. Lord, just kill the spider. Many times we ask, D.L. Moody said, many times we ask the Lord to forgive us of some sin, yet we leave the source of temptation in our life. If God's today be too soon for your repentance, your tomorrow may be too late for God's acceptance. Did you get that? If God's today is too soon for your repentance, then your tomorrow may be too late for God's acceptance. My spirit will not always strive with man. But God says, except you repent, you will all likewise perish. And then we not only insist repentance, we insist on regeneration. The Bible says you must be born again. Not, not, a, not it would be good not it is, a, it is highly suggested, but Jesus said you must be born again. In order to see the kingdom of God, in order to know that you'll see heaven one day, you must have a spiritual birth. Charles Spurgeon used an analogy. He said if you put on one side of a room a slap-up meal, <laughs> didn't know they had that expression back in the 1800s, it was a slap-up meal from the best chef in England. And on the other side, a pig trough filled with pig slop. And you released a pig into that room. Every single time, the pig will go to the trough. Why? Because he's a pig, and that's what pigs do. But, if you supernaturally transformed that pig into a human being and released him into that room, he would not go to the trough. In fact, he would almost get sick to his stomach looking at what's in the trough. He would go over to the, the, the meal that the chef has prepared, and he would eat that up. Why? He's not a pig anymore. He's been regened, regenerated. That's what regened means. It means you've been changed, you've been transformed, you've been changed into another creature. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And if you're truly converted and you truly know Christ as your Savior, that illustration should describe your life. It doesn't mean that, that there's occasionally a time that you won't fall into the mud hole. But your nature is not such that you stay in the mud hole anymore. You want to get out of that mud hole as soon as you can and get cleaned up and stay as far away from that mud hole as you possibly can. Why? That shows your nature. If you're here tonight and you're in the mud hole of sin and you're in the mud hole away from God and you're enjoying it and you don't have any conviction in your soul, my friend, don't sell yourself on something you did years ago saying, I prayed a prayer. What evidence is there in your life right now that you know Christ is your Savior? Have you been regened? Have you been regenerated? Have you been born again? Oh, listen, there's a little song we used to sing, remember? 
Uh, the things I used to do, I don't do them anymore. The things I used to do, I don't do them anymore. The things I used to do, I don't do them anymore. There's been a great change since I've been born again. Things I used to say, I don't say them anymore. The place I used to go, I don't go there anymore. See, what happened? There's been a great change since I've been born again. We tell people, listen, we've, we've, done a, we've done a disservice to people thinking that there's no change in their life, there's no desire for the things of God, there's no, there's no change in their nature at all towards sin and the things of sin, and yet they say, well, back yonder 12 years ago, I, I, I asked Jesus to save me, so I'm good. There's nothing in the Bible that talks about that. There's no one in the Bible that just says you say a prayer and yeah, that covers it all. You never have to have a changed life. Boy, it's quiet in here, isn't it? I, I want to see, see evidence. I want to see something in my life that tells me that I'm a child of God. That, that, there's, that, that I've been born again. And there's changes that take place. So we insist, hey, the old time religion insists on repentance and regeneration. Repentance toward God and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Then we also insist on retribution. Say, so what's that talking about? Retribution means that there's a hell to shun and a heaven to gain. That God is righteous and God certainly will punish those who don't accept Christ as their Savior and they will be punished in hell. And my friend, listen, don't put off today. That's why God is so urgent about salvation. I was thinking about this. I was writing this message and thinking about those people who a week ago yesterday, a week ago Saturday, were, were in a limousine celebrating a birthday. Twenty of them. Having no idea that four sisters and their spouses and, and friends, twenty in that limousine, would be their last ride they'll ever take. That day they went into eternity, my friend. And if they did not know Jesus Christ as their Savior, they are screaming in hell tonight. That's not just what I think. That's what the Bible teaches. The Bible says, He that believeth not the Son, He said, you're condemned already. We're all born in that condemnation under the wrath of God on sin. And my friend, there's a hell. Some are here tonight and you know you're not saved. You know you don't know Christ your Savior and you're waiting. What are you waiting for? You can wait till it's eternally too late. Don't put it off. Don't wait another day. Tomorrow is the greatest, is a great tool of Satan. Today is the day, God says, of salvation. Don't drop into hell. Don't expect a preacher. This preacher is not going to get up and tell a lie to people and say you're in heaven when I don't know that you've ever been born again. Retribution. Much of the new religion of today says, oh, it only dwell on the positive. Don't, don't tell people, there, don't talk about sin, don't talk about hell, don't talk about judgment. Just talk about how, how, how good God is and how much God loves them. And God does love us. That's why He sent His only Son. But my friend, if you spit in His face and say, I'm not accepting your Son, I'm not accepting your sacrifice for me, God has no choice but then in His justice to condemn you to suffer in hell for your own sin. Retribution. That's why, that's why we're an old-fashioned church. We insist on some things. You're not going to be a member at Bible Baptist Church unless you've been born again. You have to be born again and, and follow the Lord in baptism. Now, I understand we insist on some things, and I realize that if, 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 that's, if that's, going to, that's not going to make us very popular, I know it won't. And if our only goal is to grow numerically, then we're doing it all wrong. We ought to lighten up and not practice and preach the whole Bible. We ought to just preach more on happiness and not so much on holiness. 
But our goal is not just to grow numerically, but to grow spiritually as well. And to live a life pleasing to God. God who says, I accept you as you are, but I love you too much to leave you as you are. The old time, the unpopular religion insists on some things. Repentance, regeneration, and retribution. But secondly, I want you to know the old time religion involves some things. It involves some things. Number one, it involves a book that doesn't have any errors in it. <clears throat> I believe the Bible, this Bible right here, is the inspired, infallible, inerrant Word of God. I believe it doesn't just contain God's Word. I believe it is God's words. I believe it ought to have authority in our life. I believe God's kept it for us and He has it for us here in our English language in the King James Bible. This isn't, this isn't just a manual of religion. This isn't just a book that you ought to consult every now and then. I believe you ought to follow the Bible literally. Unless there's indication in the passage that it ought to be taken figuratively or symbolically. But we take it as God's Word. We don't believe that the Bible has any errors. I don't believe you look at the Bible and say this would be better translated. Who am I to say it ought to be better translated? <laughs> we don't correct the Bible. We allow the Bible to correct us. So we believe it's a book without error. We believe all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable. So we believe in a book that has no errors. We believe and we involve a blessed hope. The Bible teaches that Jesus Christ is coming again. He's returning. That hasn't changed. I know. I've been in church all of my life. And, and I know for ever since I have any cognitive memory uh, for, uh, I'm sure, 55 or 54 years, I've heard preach Jesus is coming again. You say, well, it's been 54 years and He still hasn't come. I know. But I'm closer tonight than we were 54 years ago. And the promise is still true. Jesus is still coming again. And listen, it's a blessed hope. And hope in the Bible, you understand, is not a cross your fingers, carry four leaf clover, put a horseshoe in your pocket, hope, hope, hope. That's not what the Bible means when it says hope. Hope in the Bible is a surety. It's a sure thing. And it's a blessed hope of the believer. These today want to take away, listen, and, and it is... They want to take away the imminent return of Jesus Christ. If they say Jesus isn't coming till halfway into the tribulation or He's going to come at this point and after this happens, well listen my friend, then uh, why do we need to be ready? Why did Jesus say watch? For you know not what hour the Son of Man cometh. See, don't listen to anybody who puts a time or a date on when Jesus is coming back. You could say, well, I think He's coming back on Sunday, October 14th. Well, it's already October 15th in Japan. It's already October 15th in Australia. So now, is He coming back on Eastern Standard Time or He's coming back on some other time? There's 12 time zones in the world, aren't there? 24? Which one is He on? I imagine He'd be on Jerusalem time if He was on anybody's time. But I believe Jesus is coming, and I believe He could come today. The Bible says we ought to be looking for His appearing. and We ought to be conscious and aware of that, the blessed hope of the believer. So the old-time religion involves a book without error and involves the blessed hope, but it also involves the blood atonement. And I won't labor this point. We covered the blood pretty well this morning. But do you understand the, did you understand the first, the first fight and the first murder in all of history was over how to approach God. Abel bought the blood sacrifice and Cain brought the fruit of his own hands. And, and God gave Cain the opportunity with the sin uh, offering there at the door. He said, Here, there's your sin, you could have it right there and, and offer this as an offering to me. And Cain wouldn't do it. 
I don't want to go by the way of the blood. I don't want to go by the sacrifice of another. But the Bible says we're not redeemed with corruptible things such as silver and gold. From your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ. So the redemption involves blood atonement. I still believe there's power, power, wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. Don't underestimate. Don't do without the blood. I'm not, we're not going to take the blood out of the hymnal. We're not going to take the blood out of the Bible. The blood is essential. It will never lose its power. So the old time religion insists on some things. It involves some things. But then i got to tell you number three, and this is where the rub really comes in. The old time religion interferes with some things. It interferes with some things. You see, popular religion doesn't interfere with pleasures or customs or hobbies or habits or jobs or families or personal plans. You just, uh, you just come up with a religion to let man be and do and go when and where he wants without any interference and you'll be popular in most places. See, most people just want a religious coat they can put on, go to church, and then go home and hang the coat up in the closet and I'll put it back on next Sunday if I don't have something else to do. Well, I want to go over to this church because it has a Saturday night service and that way I can free up my Sundays for football. I'm pretty sure I've read in the Bible that it's the Lord's Day. Sunday is the Lord's Day. Not the NFL's Day. It's the Lord's Day. It's not the PGA Tour's Day. It's the Lord's Day. You see, when you preach like that and you preach the whole counsel of God, people begin to understand, hey, you're interfering with my life. We've got we to gotta back off a little bit and, and people in this day and age... They, they, n nobody's going to tell me what to do. Nobody's going to tell me how to live. Nobody's going to, uh, and, and when you, as on, on our side of things, as pastors, when you read what people write about churches and about preaching and teaching now, you hear things like you can't preach to people anymore. You got to, you got to have uh, screens and show slides and, and, you know, put on a production and usually keep it 12 to 15 minutes. That's about all the longer you'll hold anybody's attention. That's what they're marketing for the churches. Don't tell me what to do. Used to be, I think I said it the other week, people in church would say, uh, that convicts me. And they would want God to change their heart. And now people say, that offends me. I'm not going back there. That's where we live in our day and age. You understand, Christians, because of the society we've grown up in now for the last generation, we have an authority issue. The, the, the culture we've grown up in is, has been one of rebellion to authority. We see it. You see it when, when the Congress of the United States and they, they, they go ahead and they pass by vote and they, they do it according to the law of the land and put a Supreme Court justice on the bench and people are kicking at the door and scratching on the doors of the Supreme Court and yelling and screaming, throwing a temper tantrum. So why are they doing that? Because they never had a mom and dad to put them across their knee and apply the Board of Education to the seat of learning. That's why they're doing that. They, they're, they're just spoiled little children. and, and they're, but, but listen, it's not just the lost that are that way. Christians have become that way. Everybody gets stiff-necked when, when authority wants to tell them what they ought to do. They always feel like, listen, you, you hold back God's blessing in your life when God puts God-ordained authorities in your life and you don't want to listen to them, you don't want to follow them, you don't want to obey them, you, don't want, you always feel like you know better than they know. 
What are you going to do with a child when you try to instruct them and they say, eh, I, I, I'm not going to do that. I know what I should do. Hmm? You say, you know, here's the, here's the situation. Then why did God give you a parent? Hmm? And sometimes I want to ask church members, why did God give you a pastor? You see, people don't want to uh, follow authority. Religion would be popular and we could be part of that popular religion if we just left out any obligation or responsibility. You see, there's churches today that if someone comes into the church and they find out they can sing or they can play an instrument or they can they know sign language, boy, they say, hey, come on, come on, you come do this. And they don't know whether they're saved or lost. They don't know whether they live a clean life or not. They don't know if they're born again or not born again. They're not even a member of the church. Many of the modern mega churches that you see, they don't even have membership. You just want to come, you come. You want to come up and do something, you come up and do something. And nobody knows anything about their life. You see, the old time religion interferes with some things. For example, cleanliness. So what do you mean cleanliness? Uh, take a bath, use deodorant? Well, that wouldn't hurt. But we're talking here about a clean heart, clean head, and clean hands. The Bible talks about cleanliness. By the way, just so you have it, cleanliness is next to godliness. Uh, that's a good saying, but it's not in the Bible, okay? Just so we're clear on that. I had an inmate a few weeks ago at the prison quote that to him. He says, he couldn't stay for a whole RU meeting because he had to go back and take a shower. I said, well, I'm sure your cellmates appreciate that. But, you know, he says, cleanliness is next to godliness. I said, well, it's, it doesn't hurt, but that's not in the Bible. Brother Wallace said, I should have told the guy, what good will it do if you have a clean, if you have a clean body and you end up going to hell? I don't think as good as Bob Wallace does, but... And uh, I would have said that to the fella. Cleanliness. I've talked about having a clean heart before God. Having clean hands and a, a clean testimony before Him. That's important. That your testimony is good. We also think you ought to have a concern and a burden for the lost and for others. How did the Bible, What did Jesus say how others would know that we belong to Him. By this shall all men know you're my disciples because you wear a tie to church. No, He didn't say that. Though, I think it's good to wear a tie to church. I think it's good to dress up for church. Some of you rascals, you like old-fashioned Sunday because you don't have to dress up. And that's just a matter of, listen, it's just a matter of we want to give God our best. That's all. You want to, I, I, I should look, when I go to a ball game, I'll look like I'm going to a ball game. When I go golfing, I'll look like I'm going golfing. But when I go to church, I'll look like I'm going to church. Thank you, Brother Woods. Appreciate that. I'm glad you're here tonight. At least I have somebody to amen that. I'm gonna get, it's going to get real lonely here in a little bit. Hold on. So we have a concern. By the way, God says no. Jesus said, by this shall all men know you're my disciples if ye have love one to another. They're going to notice how you love one another, how you willingly, sacrificially give yourself for each other, not thinking anything in return. You'll help one another and love one another and not expect, well, okay, hey, I did this for you and I did that for you, now it's time for you to help me. God says, no, they'll notice that you help and you're not expecting anything in return. You'll love each other. But then we also find out that we expect something of conduct. You see, we believe the Bible teaches that your behavior ought to be affected by what you believe. That if you believe right, you'll behave right. The Bible says, Be ye holy, for I am holy. The Bible says, Love not the world, neither things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. <clears throat> the Bible says, Come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord. I'm saying the Bible makes it clear there ought to be a distinct difference between a believer and an unbeliever. And the difference should not be difficult to tell, it should be easy to tell. As easy as night and day. 
The way we walk, the way we talk, the music we listen to, the clothing we wear, the television programs we watch, the way we entertain ourselves, we belong to Jesus Christ. And that's not on Sunday morning and Sunday night and Wednesday night. That's on Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday and Thursday and Friday and Saturday too. I believe men ought to look like men and ladies ought to look like ladies. That means ladies, you ought to adorn yourself in modest apparel. And men, leave the necklaces and the earrings to the women to wear. Lot lost all influence in Sodom to witness to anybody because of how he lived in Sodom. He became just like one of them. And, and he <clears throat> wasn't separate in his walk. And so when he finally got serious about God and he went to him and said, hey, God's going to judge us. Well, they never heard judgment before. They, they went to the popular church that never talked about judgment, never talked about sin, never talked that God is going to judge unrighteousness. And so when Lot comes up with this and gets serious about, we got to get out of here, God's going to destroy this with fire and brimstone, they mocked him. They made fun of him. No power in his testimony whatsoever. He lost all influence because he was not separate in his walk. Let's be holy in our conduct. If right music is good for the church, it's good for your home and your car. If modesty is right at the church house, it's right in your house and at the workplace as well. Donald Gray Barnhouse told the story that he led a son of a very prominent family in his city to the Lord. At the time, the man was in the service, <clears throat> but he showed the reality of his conversion by immediately professing Christ before the soldiers in his military company. The war ended and the day came when he was returned to his pre-war life in the wealthy suburb of the large American city where Dr. Barnhouse ministered. He came to the pastor and he discussed his life with his family and expressed fear that he might soon slip back into his old habits. <coughs> Excuse me. He was afraid that love for parents, brothers, sisters, and friends might turn him from following after Jesus Christ. Pastor Barnhouse told him that if he was careful to make a public confession of his faith in Christ, he would not have to worry. That he would not have to give up improper friends. They would give him up. As a result of that conversation, <clears throat> let me get a drink. As a result of that conversation, the young man agreed to tell the first ten people of his old friends whom he encountered that he'd become a Christian. Well, he went home and almost immediately, <coughs> while he was still on the platform of the train station at the end of the turn trip, he met a girl who he had known socially. She was delighted to see him and asked, How have you been doing? He told her, The greatest thing that could possibly happen to me has happened. And she said, you're engaged to be married. He said, no. It's even better than that. I've taken the Lord Jesus Christ as my Savior. The girl's expression froze. She mumbled a few polite words and turned and went on her way. A short time later, the new Christian met a young man who he had known before the war going into, going into the service it's good to see you back. Hey, we're going to have some great parties now that you're home. He looked at him and said, I want you to know I've just become a Christian. And he was thinking in his mind, this is too. And again, the case of a frozen smile and a quick change of the conversation. And after the same circumstance was repeated with a young couple and two more old friends, word began to get around and most of his old friends stopped seeing him. He'd become peculiar. He'd become 
a religious fanatic. Some called him crazy. What had he done? Nothing but confess Jesus Christ is his Savior. I don't understand. Listen to me. I don't understand. Young people, listen up. I don't understand when you get interested in a boy or you get interested in a girl and somebody says, oh, are they a Christian? Oh, I don't know. We haven't talked about that. I don't understand that. You have no business even getting interested in someone who you don't know is a born-again Christian. And you don't have any interest in, listen girls, don't get interested in a fellow who isn't going to be a leader for you spiritually. You don't need to get in with a project where you've got to work on him to get him to where he wants to be. And if he's just doing it for you, once he has you and he puts a ring on your finger, you'll, you'll, be, you'll be like uh, pulling a mule that doesn't want to go when it's time to go to church. I know, you can say, say, ah, pastor, you don't know what you're talking about. No, I've only watched it for 36 years. But I'm sure at 17 or 18 or 19 or 20, you know more than I do. You know, when we talk about the old-time religion interferes, it only, it only interferes if Christ isn't your life. Years ago, I had a, a couple of ladies in the church, and as things get busy as things do at church, you know, and you, you keep busy serving the Lord, they came to me and said, you know, we've got a life too. And you get thinking about that. But I believe I read somewhere when Christ, who is our life, shall appear. Who's our life? Christ. Paul said, for to me to live is Christ. What about me? What about you? <laughs> what about me? What about me? It's Christ. Not I, but Christ. He's my life. But he's not just supposed to be a preacher's life. He's our life. This is what we do. We live for Jesus Christ. And you know what 1 John 5, 3 tells me? His commandments are not grievous. It's not, it's not grievous to follow the Lord's commandments. Not at all. I rejoice at being able to serve the Lord Jesus Christ. I rejoice in being able to, 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 to do what God wants me to do. That's why I'm here. That's why God gives me breath every day. And as long as He gives me the day, and as long as He gives me breath, I want to live a life for Him who loved me and gave Himself for me. The old time religion. It insists on repentance, regeneration, and retribution. It involves a book without error, a blessed hope, and the blood atonement. And it interferes and includes cleanliness, concern for others, and our conduct that is pleasing to the Lord. I don't know about you, but I'll take the old time religion. Give me that old time religion. Give me that old time religion. Give me that old time religion. It's good enough for me. Father, I pray that that would not just be a song we sing, but Lord, it would be the prayer of our heart. Lord, I, I realize that we take our stand at this position that it's not a popular thing with this world. But from what I see in the Scripture, following Jesus Christ and being a true follower and disciple of His has never been popular with this world. May there be a group of people 
not only here in Grove City, Ohio, but in other cities and towns across America, where people are more concerned about pleasing God than pleasing the world. Being accepted by you than being accepted by a world that's lost without you. May we understand that if we lift up Jesus Christ in our church and in our life, all men will be drawn unto Him. The attraction is in the difference. And I pray they'd see a difference in us. May we boldly confess Jesus Christ as our Savior as this young man did getting out of the service. May we, like him, tell people the one most wonderful, important thing in my life has happened to me. And may we tell them we've accepted Jesus Christ as our Savior. Help us to confess you before men. Give us that old-time religion. 